everyone, my name is Salem, and this is part one of The Perfect Match by Ken Liu. I am also drawing my humanoid version of Tilly. Sai woke to the rousing first movement of Vivaldi's violin concerto in C minor, sospetto. He lay still for a minute, letting the music wash over him like a gentle Pacific breeze. The room brightened as the blinds gradually opened to the sunlight. Tilly had woken him right at the end of a light sleep cycle, the optimal time. He felt great, refreshed, optimistic, ready to jump out of bed. Which is what he did next. Tilly, that's an inspired choice for a wake-up song. Of course, Tilly spoke from the camera slash speaker in the nightstand. Who knows your tastes and mood better than I? The voice through electronic was affectionate and playful. Sai went into the shower. Remember to wear the new shoes today, Tilly now spoke to him from the camera slash speaker in the ceiling. Why? You have a date after work. Oh, the new girl. Shoot. What's her name? I know, you told me. I'll bring you up to speed after work. I'm sure you'll like her. The compatibility index is very high. I think you'll be in love for at least six months. Sai looked forward to the date. Tilly had also introduced him to his last girlfriend, and that relationship had been wonderful. The breakup afterwards was awful, of course, but it helped that Tilly had guided him through it. He felt that he had matured emotionally, and after a month on his own, he was ready to start a new relationship. But first, he still had to get through the workday. What do you recommend for breakfast this morning? You are scheduled to attend the kickoff meeting for the Davis case at 11, which means you'll get a lunch paid for by the firm. I suggest you go light on the breakfast, maybe just a banana. Sai was excited. All the paralegals at Chapman, Sing, Stevens, and Rio's lived for client lunches made by the firm's own executive chef. Do I have time to make my own coffee? You do. Traffic is light this morning. But I suggest you go to this new smoothie place along the way instead. I can get you a coupon code. But I really want coffee. Trust me, you'll love the smoothie. Sai smiled as he turned off the shower. Okay, Tilly, you always know best. Although it was another pleasant and sunny morning in Las Aldamas, California, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, Sai's neighbor Jenny was wearing a thick winter coat, ski goggles, and a long, dark scarf that covered her hair and the rest of her face. I thought I told you I didn't want that thing installed, she said as he stepped out of his apartment. Her voice was garbled through some kind of electronic filter. In response to his questioning look, she gestured to the camera over Sai's door. Talking to Jenny was like talking to one of his grandmother's friends who refused to use Centillion email or get a share all account because they were afraid of having the computer know all their business. Except that, as far as he could tell, Jenny was his age. She had grown up a digital native, but somehow had missed the ethos of sharing. Jenny, I'm not going to argue with you. I have a right to install anything I want over my door. And I want Tilly to keep an eye on my door when I'm away. Apartment 308 was just burglarized last week. But your camera will record visitors to my place, too. Because we share this hallway. So... I don't want Tilly to have any of my social graph. Sai rolled his eyes. What do you have to hide? That's not the point. Yeah, yeah, civil liberties, freedom, privacy, blah, blah, blah. Sai was sick of arguing with people like Jenny. He had made the same point countless times. Centillion is not some big, scary government. It's a private company whose motto happens to be make things better. Just because you want to live in the Dark Ages does not mean the rest of us shouldn't enjoy the benefits of abiscuous computing. He dodged around her bulky frame to get to the stairs. Tilly doesn't just tell you what you want, Jenny shouted. She tells you what to think. Do you even know what you really want anymore? Sai paused for a moment. Do you? She pressed. What a ridiculous question. Just the kind of Buceto intellectual anti-technology rant that people like her mistake for profundity. He kept on walking. Freak, he muttered, expecting Tilly to chime in from his phone earpiece with some joke to cheer him up. But Tilly said nothing. Having Tilly around was like having the world's best assistant. Hey Tilly, do you remember where I kept that Wyoming filing with the weird company name and the F-marger from maybe six months ago? 
Hey, Tilly, can you get me a form of Section 131 Articles? Make sure it's a form that associates working with sign use. Hey, Tilly, memorize these pages. Assign them these tags. Chapman, favors buyer. Only use if associate is nice to me. For a while, Chapman Sign had resisted the idea of allowing employees to bring Tilly into the office, preferring their propriety corporate AI system, but it proved too difficult to force employees to keep their personal calendars and recommendations rigidly separate from work ones, and once the partners started to violate the rules and use Tilly for work, IT had to support them. And Centillion then pledged that they would encrypt all corporate-derived information in a secure manner and never use it for competitive purposes, only to give better recommendations to employees of Chapman's sign. After all, the mission statement of Centillion was to arrange the world's information to ennoble the human race. What could be more ennobling than making work more efficient, more productive, more pleasant? As Sai enjoyed his lunch, he felt very lucky. He couldn't even imagine what drudgy work would have been like before Tilly came along. After work, Tilly guided Sai to the flower shop. Of course, Tilly had a coupon. And then, on the way to the restaurant, she filled Sai in on his date. Ellen, educational background. Share all profile. Reviews by previous boyfriends slash girlfriends. Interests, likes, dislikes, and of course, pictures. Dozens of photos recognized and gathered by Tilly from around the net. Sai smiled. As usual, Tilly was right. Ellen was exactly his type. It was a truism that what a man wouldn't tell his best friend, he'd happily search for on Centillion. Tilly knew all about what kind of woman Sai found attractive. Having observed the pictures and videos, he perused late at night while engaging the just-for-me mode in his browser. And of course, Tilly would know Ellen just as well as she knew him. So, Sai knew that he would be exactly Ellen's type too. As predicted, it turned out they were into the same books, the same movies, the same music. They had compatible ideas about how hard one should work. They laughed at each other's jokes, and they fed off each other's energy. Sai marveled at Tilly's accomplishment. Four billion women on Earth, and Tilly had seemed to have just found the perfect match for him. It was just like hitting the I trust you button on Centillion's search back in the early days, and how it knew just the right web page to take you to. Sai could feel himself falling in love, but he could tell that Ellen wanted to ask him to come home with her. Although everything had gone exceedingly well, if he was being completely honest with himself, it wasn't quite as exciting and lovely as he expected. Everything was indeed going smoothly, but maybe just a tad too smoothly. It was as if they already knew everything there was to know about each other. There were no surprises, no thrill of finding the truly new. In other words, the date was a bit boring. As Sai's mind wandered, there was a lull in the conversation. They smiled at each other and just tried to enjoy the silence. In that moment, Tilly's voice burst into his earpiece. You might want to ask her if she likes contemporary Japanese desserts. I know just the place. Sai realized that though he hadn't been aware of it until just then, he did suddenly have a craving of something sweet and delicate. Tilly doesn't just tell you what you want. She tells you what to think. Sai paused. Do you even know what you really want anymore? He tried to sort out his feelings. Did Tilly just figure out what he hadn't even known he wanted? Or did she just put that thought into his head? Do you? The way Tilly filled in that lull, it was as if Tilly didn't trust that he would be able to manage the date on his own, as if Tilly thought he wouldn't know what to say or do if she didn't jump in. Sai suddenly felt irritated. The moment had been ruined. I'm being treated like a child. I know you'll like it. I have a coupon. Tilly, he said, please stop monitoring and terminate auto-suggestions. Are you sure? Gaps in sharing can cause your profile to be incomplete. Yes, please seize. With a beep, Tilly turned herself off. Ellen stared at him, eyes and mouth wide open in shock. Why did you do that? I wanted to talk to you alone, just the two of us, Sai smiled. It's nice sometimes to just be ourselves, without Tilly, don't you think? Ellen looked confused. But you know that the more Tilly knows, the more helpful she can be. Don't you want to be sure we don't make silly mistakes on our first date? We're both busy, and Tilly, I, I know what Tilly can do, but... 
Ellen held up a hand, silencing him. She tilted her head, listening to her headset. I have the perfect idea, Ellen said. There's this new club, and I know Tilly can get us a coupon. Sai shook his head, annoyed. Let's try to think of something to do without Tilly. Would you please turn her off? Ellen's face was unreadable for a moment. I think I should head home, she said. Early work day tomorrow. She looked away. Did Tilly tell you to say that? She said nothing, and avoid looking into his eyes. I had a great time, Sai added quickly. Would you like to go out again? Ellen paid half the bill and did not ask him to walk her home. You're being very antisocial tonight, Tilly said. I'm not antisocial, I just didn't like how you're interfering with everything. I have every confidence you would have enjoyed the rest of the date had you have followed my advice. Sai drove on in silence. I sense a lot of aggression in you. How about some kickboxing? You haven't gone in a while, and there's a 24-hour gym coming up. Take her right here. Sai drove straight on. What's wrong? I don't feel like spending more money. You know I have a coupon. What exactly do you have against me saving my money? Your saving rate is right on target. I simply want to make sure you're sticking to your regimen of consumption of leisure. If you oversave, you'll later regret that you didn't make the most of your youth. I've plotted the optimum amount of consumption you should engage in daily. Tilly, I just want to go home and sleep. Can you shut yourself off for the rest of the night? You know that in order to make the best life recommendations, I need to have a complete knowledge of you. If you shut me out of parts of your life, my recommendations won't be as accurate. Sai reached into his pocket and turned off his phone. The earpiece went silent. When Sai got home, he saw that the light over the stairs leading up to his apartment had gone out, and several dark shapes skulked it around the bottom. Who's there? Several of the shadows scattered, but one came toward him. Jenny. You're back early. He almost didn't recognize her. This was the first time he'd heard her voice without the electronic filter she normally used. It sounded surprisingly... happy. Sai was taken aback. How did you know I was back early? You're stalking me? Jenny rolled her eyes. Why would I need to stalk you? Your phone automatically checks in and out of everywhere you go with the status message based on your mood. It's all on your share all life cast for anyone to see. He stared at her. In the faint glow from the streetlights, he could see that she wasn't wearing her thick winter coat or ski goggles or scarf. Instead, she was in shorts and a loose white t-shirt. Her black hair had been dyed white in streaks. In fact, she looked very pretty, if a bit nerdy. What? Surprised that I do know how to use a computer? It's just that you usually seem so... Paranoid? Crazy? Say what's on your mind, I won't be offended. Where's your coat and goggles? I've never even seen you without them. Oh, I taped over your door camera so my friends could come for a visit tonight, so I'm not wearing them. I'm sorry, you did what? And I came out here to meet you because I saw that you turned off Tilly, not once, but twice. I'm guessing you're finally ready for the truth. Stepping into Jenny's apartment was like stepping into the middle of a fishing net. The ceiling, floor, walls were all covered with a fine metal mesh, which glinted like liquid silver in the flickering light from the many large high-definition computer monitors stacked on top of each other around the room, apparently the only sources of illumination. Beside the monitors, the only other visible furniture appeared to be bookshelves, full of books, the paper kind, strangely enough. A few upside-down ancient milk crates covered with cushions served as chairs. Sai had been feeling restless, had wanted to do something strange, but he now regretted his decision to accept her invitation to come in. She was indeed eccentric, perhaps too much so. Jenny closed the door and reached up and plucked the earpiece out of Sai's ear, then she held out her hand. Give me your phone. Why, it's already off. Jenny's hand didn't move. Reluctantly, Sai took out his phone and gave it to her. She looked at it contemptuously. No removable battery. Just what you'd expect of a centillion phone. They should call these things tracking devices, not phones. You can never be sure they're really off. She slipped the phone inside a thick pouch, sealed it, and dropped it on the desk. Okay, now that your phone is acoustically and electromagnetically shielded, we can talk. The mesh on the walls basically makes my apartment into a Faraday cage, so cellular signals can't get through. But I don't feel comfortable around a centillion phone until I can put a few layers of shielding around it. 
I'm just going to say it, you are nuts. You think Centillion spies on you? Their privacy policy is the best in the business. Every bit of information they gather has been given up by the user voluntarily. It's all used to make the user's life better. Jenny tilted her head and looked at him with a smirk until he stopped talking. If that's all true, why did you turn Tilly off tonight? Why did you agree to come up here with me? So I wasn't sure he himself knew the answers. Look at you. You've agreed to have cameras observe your every move, to have every thought, word, interaction recorded in some distant data center so that algorithms could be run over them, mining them for data that marketers pay for. Now you've got nothing left that's private, something that's yours and yours alone. Centillion owns all of you. You don't even know who you are anymore. You buy what Centillion wants you to buy. You read what Centillion suggests you to read. You date who Centillion thinks you should date, but are you really happy? That's an outdated way to look at it. Everything Tilly suggests to me has been scientifically proven to fit my taste profile, to be something I'd like. You mean some advisor paid Centillion to pitch at you. That's the point of advertising, isn't it? Isn't it? To match desire with satisfaction. There are thousands of products in this world that would have been perfect for me, but I might never have known about them, just like there's a perfect girl out there for me, but I might never have met her. What's wrong with listening to Tilly so that the perfect product finds the perfect consumer, that the perfect girl finds the perfect boy? Jenny chuckled. I love how you're so good at rationalizing your state. I ask you again, if life with Tilly is so wonderful, why did you turn her off tonight? I can't explain it, Sai said. He shook his head. This is a mistake. I think I'll head home. Wait, let me show you a few things about your beloved Tilly first, Jenny said. She went to the desk and started typing, bringing up a series of documents on a monitor. She talked to Sai, tried to scan them, and get their gist. Years ago, they caught Centillion's traffic monitoring cars sniffing all the wireless traffic from home networks on the streets they drove through. Centillion also used to override the security settings on your machine and track your browsing habits before they shifted to an opt-in monitoring policy designed to provide better recommendations. Do you think they've really changed? They hunger for data about you. The more, the better. And damned if they care about how they get it. Sai so flicked through the documents skeptically. If this is all true, why hasn't anyone brought it up to the news? Jenny laughed. First, everything Centillion did was arguably legal. The wireless transmissions were floating in public space. For example, there was no violation of privacy, and the end-user agreement could be read to allow everything Centillion did to make things better for you. Second, these days, how do you get your news except through Centillion? If Centillion doesn't want you to see something, you won't. So how do you find these documents? My machine is connected to a network built on top of the net, one that Centillion can't see inside. Basically, we rely on a virus that turns people's computers into relaying stations for us, and everything is encrypted and bounced around so that Centillion can't see our traffic. Sai shook his head. You're really one of those tinfoil hack conspiracy theorists. You make Centillion sound like some evil, repressive government, but it's just a company trying to make some money. Jenny shook her head. Surveillance is surveillance. I can never understand why some people think it matters whether it's the government doing it to you or a company. These days, Centillion is bigger than governments. Remember it managed to topple three countries, governments, just because they dared to ban Centillion within their borders? Those were repressive places. Oh, right, and you live in the land of the free. You think Centillion was trying to promote freedom? They wanted to be able to get in there and monitor everyone and urge them all to consume more so that Centillion could make more money. But that's just business. It's not the same thing as evil. You say that, but that's only because you don't know what the world really looks like anymore, now that it's been remade in Centillion's image. Although Jenny's car was heavily shielded like her apartment, as she and Cy drove, she whispered anyway, as if she were afraid that their conversation would be overheard by people walking on the sidewalk. I can't believe how decrepit this place looks, Sai said as she parked the car by the side of the street. The surface of the road was pockmarked with potholes and houses around them, in ill repair. A few had been abandoned and were falling apart. 
In the distance, they could hear the fading sound of a police siren. This was not a part of Las Almadas that Sai had ever been to. It wasn't like this even ten years ago. What happened? Centillion noticed a certain tendency for people, some people, not all, to self-segregate by race when it came to where they wanted to live. The company tried to serve this need by prioritizing different real estate listings to searchers based on their race. Nothing illegal about what they're doing, since they were just satisfying a need and desire in their users. They weren't hiding any listings, just pushing them far down the list, and in any event, you couldn't ever pick apart the algorithm and prove that they were looking at race when it was just one out of hundreds of factors in their magical ranking formula. After a while, the process began to snowball, and the segregation got worse and worse. It became easier for the politicians to gerrymander districts based on race. So here we are. Guess who got stuck in these parts of towns? So I took a deep breath. I had no idea. If you ask Centillion, they'll say that their algorithms just reflected and replicated the desire to self-segregate in some of their users, and that Centillion wasn't in the business of policing thoughts. Oh, they'd claim that they were actually increasing freedom by giving people just what they wanted. They'd neglect to mention that they were profiting off of it through real estate commissions, of course. I can't believe no one ever says anything about this. You're forgetting again that everything you know comes filtered through Centillion. Whenever you do a search, whenever you hear a news digest, it's been curated by Centillion to fit what it thinks you want to hear. Someone upset by the news isn't going to buy anything sold by the advertisers, so Centillion adjusts things to make it all okay. It's like we're all living in Oz's Emerald City. Centillion puts these thick green goggles over our eyes and we all think everything is a beautiful shade of green. You're accusing Centillion of censorship. No, Centillion is an algorithm that's got out of hand. It just gives you more of what it thinks you want. And we, people like me, think that's the root of the problem. Centillion has put us in little bubbles where all we see and hear are echoes of ourselves and we become even more stuck in our existing beliefs and exaggerated in our inclinations. We stop asking questions and accept Tilly's judgment on everything. Year after year, we become more docile and grow more wool for Centillion to shave off and grow rich with. But I don't want to live that way. And why are you telling me all of this? Because, neighbor, we're going to kill Tilly. Jenny said, giving Sai a hard look, and you're going to help us do it. Jenny's apartment, with all its windows tightly shut and curtained, felt even more stifling after the car ride. Sai looked around at the flickering screen, showing dancing, abstract patterns, suddenly wary. And just how are you planning to kill Tilly, exactly? We're working on a virus, a cyber weapon, if you want to get all macho about it. What exactly would it do? Since the lifeblood of Tilly is a data, the billions of profiles Centillion has compiled on every user, that's how we have to take it down. Once inside the Centillion data center, the virus will gradually alter every user profile it encounters and create new fake profiles. We want it to move slowly to avoid detection, but eventually it will have poisoned the data so much that it will no longer be possible for Tilly to make creepy controlling predictions about users. And if we do it slowly enough, they can't even go to the backups because they'll be corrupt too. Without the data it's built over the decades, Centillion's advertising run of view will dry up overnight and poof, Tilly will be gone. Sai imagined the billions of bits in the cloud, his tastes, likes, and dislikes, secret desires, announced intentions, history of searches, purchases, articles, and book reads, pages browsed. Collectively, the bits made up a digital copy of him. Literally. Was there anything that was a part of him that wasn't also up there in the cloud, curated by Tilly? Wouldn't unleashing a virus on that be like suicide? Like murder? But then he remembered how it felt to have Tilly lead him by the nose on every choice. How he had been content, like a pig, happily wallowing in, it, in his enclosure. The bits were his, but not him. He had will that could not be captured in bits, and Tilly had almost succeeded in making him forget that. How can I help? Sai asked. 